Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today we're continuing our study of the book of Acts, and today we're going to begin with chapter 13, verse 43. Now obviously we did start the study from the very beginning of Acts. Chapter 1, verse 1, all those prior videos, they're uploaded and available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So I, I really hope you will go back and watch this study from its entirety, uh, in its entirety, from the beginning, I should say. All right, uh, before we get started, let me ask Brother Ted and Brother Joe to say hi to everybody. Hi, everybody. This is Ted here with my channel. It's God's Truth Ministries, and I've got some videos over there for uh, evangelism, you know, getting the gospel out of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I've also got some videos on there uh, to believers uh, teaching us our riches and our identity and our security uh, in Christ and uh, all the blessings that we have in Him. So a few videos on there about that. I pray you'll listen to those. And uh, keep with us on the study of the book of Acts. It's just getting better. And uh, there, there's true drama here as we're going through this book. And I pray you guys will stick around for it. It's a big blessing. Back to you. All right. And uh, this is Joe with me. Uh, Sebastian Dresden channel, a channel for fellowship and learning, and I've got a few uh, videos up. Uh, uh, I, if I may suggest one, it's one called The Greatest Sermon I've Ever Heard, and it, it's, uh, it's up at my channel. If you get a chance to listen to that, uh, some old ex-Catholic guy, not, not me, but uh, just a great, great uh, word if you get a chance to watch that. I just want to throw that in today. All right, back to you. Okay, we're going to begin now in the King James Version, uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 43. <clears throat> uh, now, when the congregation was broken up, and many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Uh, let me stop there, verse 45. And uh, whoever's going to go first, maybe you could lay a little bit of context uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I, I think it's my turn, uh, Ted. Is it not, or, or did you did I go last first last time? No, it's your turn, brother. Okay. Uh, now it, it's been a few days, so uh, if I remember right, uh, uh, Paul had just someone's got to tell me. Did Paul just get out of jail? Is that where we're at? No, Paul. Uh, Paul just gave this great sermon. You said it's the only time he's preached the entire. Uh, his entire sermon is recorded in the scriptures, and then of course the the Jew at the synagogue and the Jews. Uh, they they weren't happy about it, but the Gentiles uh, they they loved it and they wanted him to preach again. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It, you know, it was fascinating. I'm sorry, I lose track, guys. My mind's not what it used to be. Uh, yeah, that was fantastic, our, our last study. Uh, I really enjoyed that, and for anyone who may not have heard it, uh, it was the first full sermon, and, and according to Chuck Smith, the only time Paul is ever recorded as a full sermon from beginning to end. And uh, and it was so funny because all of the natural Jews, the, the people that were born into Judaism, uh, bloodline Jews, I call them, all walked out. And the, all the Gentiles, or the converted Gentiles, the uh, Hellenistic Jews, stayed and asked him, Hey, Paul, come back next Sunday and say this, this thing again, this gospel, because we're fascinated. And I, I just was uh, taken aback, because I remember the uh, Old Testament prophecies, and I think the Lord mentioned it, that you know, uh, Israel... Uh, the bloodline anyway, will have blinders on, and it's almost a spiritual blindness, and it sure manifested uh, during this uh, first uh, public ser uh, sermon by Paul that there was a full sermon recorded anyway. And so uh, that's just fascinating. And 
Okay, and on to today. Uh, sorry, I lost my place, guys. On to today. Uh, I, I find it kind of unusual uh, that uh, that he was being persuaded to continue in the grace of God, Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking to them. You know, they're saying, hey, you know, not that they needed that said to them, but, you know, the, the congregation or the, uh, the, the Gentiles, the converted Gentiles are saying, hey, you know, continue on with this. By all means, we're, we're all fascinated. I mean, yeah, if they weren't converted, they, they were definitely interested. And uh, going on, uh, the next day, the Sabbath day, came and almost the whole city came out to hear the word of God. Oh, my gosh. Well, that's that's huge. Uh, not a small town we're talking about here, and and I'm fascinated that the the Jews were filled with envy. I mean, we're now the Pharisees in the past with Peter were full of anger and rage, and uh, this is more like the sorcerer uh, Simon, uh, who was envious of their power. And uh, uh, now I, Simon, uh, the sorcerer, I think, came to the Lord and, and just envied their power. Well, these guys are outside of God, and they're still envious, not angry, not rageful, but envious. And, so, and then uh, because of their envy, they went out contradicting and blaspheming. You know, I've gotten into big arguments with my brother before, and uh, he just uh, angers me. Now, he's, my brother's a, a bona fide rich guy. He makes a lot of money, and he's got a, a big company. And i got to tell you, I am envious. You know, when he pulls up in his brand-new Corvette that he gets every year, and, uh, you know, he lives in very grand circumstance. And I'm a little bit envious. And when we get into fights... <laughs> And other family members are privy to our argument, and I don't mean fisticuffs, but you know, whatever. I have a tendency to start knocking him because of his wealth, and and uh, and playing that card against him almost involuntarily. I contradict what he says, and I use that against him, and uh, I'm more down to earth. You know, I really do uh, uh, shuffle from the bottom of or deal from the bottom of the deck. Uh, because I'm envious of him and a little bit, you know, and, and I, I re recognize that. And I know it's a sin and it shouldn't be, but it, it happens. <clears throat> it sounds like that's kind of the case here. And uh, but not only against them, they're blaspheming against God uh, because that's who Paul and Barnabas are advocating for in the gospel. So uh, not to ramble on so much, but that's just the thoughts that came to mind. Over to you, Ted. Well, thank you, brother. Uh, this is this is definitely, uh, to me, a fascinating portion of scripture. And uh, as you guys pointed out last time, it is the first time Paul, uh, or maybe the only time, like you guys said, that he gets through a, a sermon all the way through without being interrupted. Or, you know, usually when he gets to the part about the resurrection, he gets interrupted and, you know, all you know what breaks loose. Uh, but uh, not so here. Uh, maybe he wasn't as well known, obviously, <clears throat> here in, in Antioch, and they didn't know who he was before he stood up. You know, they gave him the invitation. They gave him the words, you know, when, when they finished the reading of the Law and the Prophets earlier in the chapter, they said, uh, you brethren, Paul obviously was probably dressed uh, as, a, as a very religious Jew, maybe in, in his, his Pharisaical robes and garb. Uh, very distinguished, probably, and so the, uh, the leader of the uh, synagogue says, "Hey, men, if you any of you brethren have something to say, uh, say it." You know, and, wow, what an open door! He got the okay from them, and then he let her rip, given the history lesson, and uh, who all the law and the prophets pointed to was the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, basically, just at the very end of, of the study last time was verse 42. Today we started in 43. Basically, it just, uh, you know, it's Paul declaring the salvation of, of Christ being the one who will justify you from all things. And it just says, and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, like everybody just everybody just left church. Everybody just left, you know, left the service. Uh, the Gentiles besought or, or invited that these words might be preached unto them the next Sabbath. 
says, hey guys, you need to, can you just imagine that nowadays? It's like, hey, an evangelist comes to town and says some encouraging words at the end of the service and uh, unbelievers in the congregation leave and those people that didn't like it and then a few people huddle up around him and uh, say, hey, can you come back next week to church or to, you know, in this case to synagogue and teach, to talk to us again? In verse 43, uh, now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul. And so there were many, it obviously had to be a big uh, big congregation there in Antioch for, for there to be uh, many of the, of the Jews and religious proselytes that followed Paul afterwards. Um, it seems like those were the ones actually in the confines of the building, maybe maybe the text is talking about the gathering after church at lunch or something after after synagogue at, at lunch or something. I don't know, but they there was many. That's the thing that's key to me. It wasn't just just a very few handful, but many Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas. And I like this: who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. So they were encouraged. The thing that jumps out to me there again is they were encouraged by the gospel. They were encouraged by what Paul had to say. And what was the result? To me, what I see as the result is they encouraged Paul and Barnabas to continue in the grace of God. didn't say they encouraged them to go be uh, law keepers and Sabbath keepers and uh, keepers of the minute matters of the law. It says they encouraged them. And I think this is the, the, the crowd, the, the, the followers, the believers, encouraged Paul and Barnabas to continue in the grace of God. So they got encouraged, and then they became encouragers. That's, that's what I'm getting out of this, guys. And the next Sabbath day, obviously there had been talk around town, the next Sabbath day came almost, get this, the whole city together to hear the message, to hear the word of God. And this, 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 that phrase, to hear the word of God, the message of God, the good news is going to be key in these next verses coming up uh, as we're going to hit some distinct uh, doctrines or a doctrine that's prevalent uh, in some circles of Christianity. So back to you, Brother Luke. Hmm. All right. Uh, to um, I want to contribute to this um, uh, context that we want to establish in, here in the beginning. Uh, connecting this study to the last one. Some important things were established. Uh, first of all, the, the time frame um, is important to understand. Uh, it's very easy for people to um, think that all these things in the Book of Acts, this is covering just like maybe a matter of a few months or a few years. But right now, this, this uh, sermon in, in Antioch this is the beginning of Paul's first missionary journey. And uh, the timelines, uh, most people who've studied the, you know, tried to place these in the proper timeline, they agree that this is roughly 20 years past Pentecost. It's about 14 years past uh, Paul's conversion. The interesting thing is that um, before Paul was converted, when people heard he was coming, or when he appeared, the church would, was running for their lives, and uh, the, the, the Jews, the, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious leaders, they were all behind Paul, who was called Saul of Tarsus. So he, uh, the, the Jewish religious leaders were all supporting him, and the Christians didn't like him. They were afraid of him. And now we've got it all reversed, whereas the, the Christians are all supporting Paul. The fear of Paul or Saul of Tarsus is long past. Um, and now it's the, the Jewish uh, b believers that are having the problem with him and that, uh, that want to get him because uh, he's, he's gone from wanting to destroy the, the church, Christianity, to uh, wanting to convert the Jews. He's still going right to a synagogue, the very first thing. This is in Antioch. Um, but the church in Antioch should be, uh, now uh, we have 
let me see at the conversion of um, Cornelius when the Gentiles first are enjoying the church we have about a 10-year period so over 10 years the church in Antioch has been having Gentiles and Jewish believers as, as in, in the church there so this is a mixed uh, mixed congregation uh, so when Paul gets up to make a sermon there uh, the, the the church is already probably pretty large in the city uh, as far as the, the number of believers and as far as uh, speculating that uh, when Paul goes in there he's dressed in all this Jewish garb that would make him appear to be a religious Jew uh, that's that's just all speculation I don't I don't it very well may be true but it but I don't know there's no way of really knowing that but it's it seems that their policy was if if someone was attending uh, in the synagogue the service that it was a routine that they would ask any uh, new people to hey get up and say a few words if you want tell us a little bit about yourself have you got anything you want to share <clears throat> and uh, so unbeknownst to them this was uh, uh, the, pro the, the Apostle Paul if they had known that in advance I doubt very much that um, um, they would have uh, you know invited him to, to speak because it was going to create a big controversy and it did but the sermon that he he gave as we said the entire sermon is recorded here and when we read that and we we were comparing it to Peter's sermons at Pentecost several other Peter sermons are recorded in Acts that we've gone over and the sermon of Peter and Paul is exactly the same sermon uh, that uh, they, they killed their Messiah the one that was promised they rejected him uh, he is the promised one Jesus it's you it's all it's he was the one that's uh, all the scriptures in the Old Testament from the law and the prophets were about him and he he was killed but he he, he believing in him is is where you get your sins forgiven and that he was raised from the dead so the, uh, the the death burial and resurrection forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus this was the same message as Peter and Paul were preaching here now what I find interesting it says that uh, almost the entire city oh by the way brother Joe you you said in your first comment that they asked him to hey could you come back next Sunday and, and preach again but of course we're thinking you know church is on Sunday now but this is still this is a synagogue and their congregations were on Saturday the Sabbath day so it would be on a Saturday but the the, the Gentile believers were excited about Paul's message they wanted him to come back again the following week and uh, uh, but the, look at the response that he got here it says that um, uh, and the next Sabbath came almost the whole city together to hear the Word of God um, so like like Peter's response where Peter had thousands of people converted um, and Paul is getting a great response here too I think that a lot of people believe but a lot of people the word has spread and now the next week everybody want, in the city wants to hear about this uh, but then the, the Jewish people who rejected the message uh, they were filled with envy and they, they spake uh, against these things where Paul was uh, preaching so they, they didn't believe in Jesus was the Messiah, the promised one, the death, burial, and resurrection. They considered Paul's message blasphemy. All right. Anything else before we, uh, you probably want to respond to some of that? Yeah, I, I just want to uh, mention one thing. <clears throat> I grew up in a, in a Baptist church uh, when I was young, and uh, uh, people were very, very Baptist. And, and uh, the, the denomination was uh, uh, critical to their thinking. Now, uh, I left that, and I, I grew out of denominationalism, but uh, the pastor's son opened a church out here in Seattle. And uh, this is some 20 years later, 25 years later, so I decided to pay the church a visit. 
And here was uh, Pastor Green, the, the son of the pastor, and, and he was still very steeped in Baptist this and Baptist that. And, uh, it was integral to everything he taught. Now, the people who rejected Paul's message here were people who had uh, recent conversions, or, or at least uh, they, were, they were not Jewish at one time. They were heathen or Gentile. Uh, and so they're still Gentile, but they're converted. And, and it, it reminds me of something Ted said that stuck in my brain. You know how I like to chew on a bone some three or four, maybe five sessions ago about people responding to life and God giving greater life. And so these, the, the Jewish people are so steeped in their tradition that accepting something new or outside of their tradition uh, is repugnant or at least uh, uh, difficult for them. But these other Gentile, the, the converted Gentiles, they've had an epiphany. They've actually not been born into their Judaism. They've had light given to them by God, and they've responded to that light to this point prior to the gospel. And so here we see the people who responded to light rather than were born into the Jewish uh, lineage responding to even more light. And so I think that that's pertinent. Now, it looks like a good deal more, uh, even within the, the uh, Jewish tradition, join in. But to begin with, uh, it's those who have responded to God's light rather than being born into it uh, that really sit up and take notice. So I think that's significant. Back to you. Let me ask you something. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that this was just a, a – um, you just misspoke. Uh, you, you said that the, the people that rejected Paul's message were the – Gentile believers. Oh, I meant that. I meant I meant they were the uh, the Jews, the, yeah. the people born into Judaism. Yeah. Well, so because you, you said two contradictory things, you said that they, they were the the ones who rejected it were the Gentiles, and then later on you said the Gentiles were the ones that believed. So that's you just you just said the opposite of what you were actually thinking, I guess, right? I do that quite yeah. often. Yeah. I I did that once in my life many years ago. All right, Brother Ted, any more? Nope, sounds good, Brother. Continue. All right, let me read on then. Verse 46. Uh, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, let me read that again. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, uh, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And uh, verse 49, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Let me stop there. What, what uh, stands out, uh, first of all, is I think Ted uh, has a point uh, being made here uh, that you, you, both you and I were iffy on. Uh, was it ordained or was it necessary for Paul to go to the synagogues or was it just his habit? And uh, judging by the way this uh, 46 is written, uh, it almost looks like it was ordained or necessary for Paul to go to the synagogue first. And so whichever one of us uh, had a contrary opinion, uh, I don't know who had what opinion, but it looks like it wasn't just a habit or something that was customary, but it was ordained that he go to the synagogue first before presenting the, the Gentiles. Back to you. Uh, Joe, you, I, th I think you can continue on if you want to cover the rest of the passage first. It's your turn to go first today. Yeah, that was, uh, that was pretty much uh, all that was going in my mind, uh, but uh, looking further on, uh, that you know, the Gentiles were glad and received the word of the Lord. And, uh, you know, here you've got the, uh, the as many were 
that were ordained to uh, eternal life. Now, a lot of people are going to grab hold of that with the uh, Calvinistic or predestined uh, doctrines and, and uh, try to make a, a spearhead out of that. But I think it, it's just referring to God's foreknowledge rather than uh, him ordaining who uh, would believe uh, aside from their free will. So uh, I'll make that point. And uh, those are the only two points that I have. Back to you, Ted. You're muted, Ted. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, okay, I think I'm on now. I think it's great that uh, what we see happening in verse 45, where the Jews, when they saw the multitudes, that they were filled with envy. And as Luke mentioned, uh, just like uh, Elimaeus the sorcerer tried to contradict uh, Paul and Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas uh, earlier in Acts, uh, you know, uh, you know, these Jews are envious. Uh, they, uh, I maybe get my stories mixed up, but I know there was there was others that were envious and contradicted, uh, tried to oppose, in other words, the things Paul and Barnabas were saying. Same things happening here in verse 45, and I, I like the result. It's what is what I wanted to just bring out, guys, and that is that. Uh, Instead of cowering down and saying, we'll, we'll, we'll be politically correct. We, we don't want to offend anybody. We'll go hide in the corner and stay in the prayer closet. Uh, that's not the kind of Christianity that Paul and Barnabas practiced at all. Uh, what did they do? It says they waxed bold. And uh, I love that because, in, in, what does he say? It was necessary that the word of God, the message of God, should be spoken first to you. And I do agree with Joe, uh, in earlier statements we brought out in the study, that the, the Jews, uh, the religious Jews, were to be the light to the Gentiles. So I do, I just will concur and, and say yes. This I think this does affirm that uh, to the Jew first was was uh, God's order, uh, the, the plan that God had for, for the day. Um, should, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. Uh, seeing you put it from you, it's your choice. You have free will. There you have free will. Uh, you have freedom of choice. Seeing you put it from you, not God ordained you to be, you guys to be unbeliever, ye, y'all. Uh, no, no such thing. You, you put it from you, and you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. It's your choice. It's everybody's choice nowadays. Do you want eternal life? Come and take of the water of life freely. That's what God says from beginning to end. I mean... I'm the bread of life. Come unto me. Come unto me. Your choice. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. It's, it's a choice. Uh, but considering you, you judge yourselves unworthy, I'm God, I'm holy, and you're sinners, and I said you, des you, you can have eternal life. You de deserve, you say you're unworthy. <laughs> I like the, I like the, uh, the tone that Paul's taking in, in his boldness. He said, Lo, uh, because of that we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord hath commanded us, saying, this is the Lord's command to Paul. And this is his word. He says, I have set thee to be a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvations to the ends of the earth. I think that's from Isaiah 42, verse 6. I've got it scribbled in my margin. Uh, I think that's where that's from. And it's other places in the Old Testament where the, the, the Jewish nation was supposed to be the light to the Gentiles, to the ends of the earth, actually. And verse 48. Now, this is supposed to be a home run. Just, just a home run for the Calvinists. This is just like, oh, there you go. Here it is. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of God. And as many were ordained to eternal life, believe, God individually selected out some Gentiles of the myriads of people cascading into hell. What a glorious thought. Uh, and these were some of the Gentiles God picked out of the ones that he didn't want to go into eternal conscious torment forever. That's simply not what the Bible teaches, and that's not what this verse teaches. That word ordained there can be a bit misleading because it has, in our modern-day terminology, the, the, the meaning of predestined, which is not it. But I did write down uh, in my margin here, <clears throat> in my other Bible, what uh, uh, ordained or appointed means in the... Uh, <clears throat> from the Concordance and the Bible Dictionary, it says, 
to be disposed towards something, to be set toward, or to be prepared. And what, <clears throat> excuse me, what prepared these Gentiles, let's say uh, from the few verses up, the previous Sabbath happened, what prepared them, what were they disposed towards, and what something, what set them towards a predisposition to become believers? Uh, the previous Sabbath, guys, the previous Sabbath, the Word of God is what prepared them, disposed them toward something, set them towards, or prepared them towards something. The Word of God, the message of God, the previous Sabbath, is what prepared these guys uh, for the message Paul gave this Sabbath. Some people believed. They heard about it. They heard part of the Word of God. Paul preaches the next Sabbath, and uh, the Jews get envious. People who are ready to receive the Word of God, believe it, receive it. It has nothing to do with God picking out uh, the puppets that he's going to have believe and, and picking out the puppets that he's or, you know, or uh, got another plan for or otherwise uh, predestined them to, to not believe. It's, it's, the verses tell us that everyone has a choice. There's free will. So uh, I just had to hit on that because that's supposed to be a home run for the Calvinist, verse 48. It's in our text, so I had to hit on that, guys. Back to you. Hmm. Brother Ted, you are such an anti-Calvinist. Wow. <laughs> I, I guess I have to admit. Yes, I am. Yes, I, I am. I am equally anti-Calvinistic. Uh, so anybody watching this video, um, if you uh, are either a Calvinist or you're you're beginning to learn about Calvinism or you're curious about Calvinism, rather than get sidetracked and turn this into a uh, contra-Calvinist uh, message, um, I have a playlist called Calvinism uh, Debunked. It's probably about 10 hours long, uh, the, the, the teaching we did, refuting all six points of Calvinism. Most people think there's five, but there are six. Uh, so we refute it completely, and it's evil. It's absolute evil, the, the philosophy. Uh, so if you, if you think I'm just being unfair, well, be fair to yourself. Watch the study against Calvinism, and then you can decide for yourself if I'm judging them correctly. Uh, but regarding this, these points here, um, the let me. I, I'd like to read this in the Amplified just to see if there's phrasing anything differently that might help us. He said, verse 46, and at the time Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and confidently, saying. It was necessary that God's message of salvation through faith in Christ be spoken to you Jews first, since you, repeat, since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Now we turn to the Gentiles, for that is what the Lord has commanded us, saying, quote, quote, and this is, he's quoting the Old Testament, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles so that you may bring the message of eternal life salvation to the end of the earth, unquote. And let me see where that is found. Uh, well, I think we, we talked about earlier where, it, where it's from. I don't see the, the footnote, but um, verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying, praising and giving thanks for the word of the Lord and all those who had been appointed or designated or ordained to eternal life by God um, believed in Jesus as the Christ and their Savior. And so the word of the Lord regarding salvation was being spread through the entire region. Uh, I guess the only point I need to uh, talk further about since you've both done a thorough job on this, is uh, this question of Paul uh, preaching to Jews first. Uh, I, 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 certainly it's saying that it was, uh, let me see how exactly it was, it was phrased there. Verse 46. Uh, it was, verse 46, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. 
Uh, so verse 46 says it was necessary. Um, I'm not going to dispute whether this was uh, what God was directing them to do and it was required or if it was, uh, we've talked about that the last time at length, but I, what I find interesting is that at this point, Paul says to them, um, because you have rejected it, he says, but seeing ye put it from you, in other words, you're rejecting it, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Uh, however, the interesting thing is that this is his first uh, beginning of his uh, first missionary uh, journey, and I, I believe as we go on in Acts, uh, we're going to find other examples of him preaching to the synagogues, to preaching to the Jews. Um, I, and I know that um, maybe it's in one of his epistles. I can't remember exactly where it is. Maybe you guys can help me out. But I'm sure there is a point where it says it was Paul's custom whenever he entered the city to go into the synagogues first. And, um, and so I, I believe that this is a, something that he continued to do even after this point when it, it's clearly said um, it's required that we talk to you, the Jews first, but now we're going on to the Gentiles. Uh, he continued doing that. It's not like... At this point, he's saying, I'm giving up on all Jews. We're only going to focus on Gentiles from here on out. He continues going into the city, still preaching to the Jews first, and then he goes on to the Gentiles. Um, the, um, a matter of fact, Paul even says at one point in his uh, one of his epistles, he tells God, he says, if, if I could lose my salvation, in order for all my brethren, the, all the Jewish people to be saved instead of me, I'll, I'll, I'll be willing to do that. I said, to me, that's a crazy thing. I, mean, I wouldn't be willing to do that. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, I find that just remarkable. The, Paul would be willing to give up his salvation if, if the Jews would just believe and be saved. Uh, so he continued all through his life, still having a love and passion for the, the Jewish people and uh, so he continued preaching to them throughout, but um, there was one other thing I was going to say about it. I'll probably remember, uh, if you guys talk any more about this, well, before we go on, I'll probably remember what else I was going to say. Go ahead. Yeah, Luke, I'm in, I'm in total agreement with you there. This was not a complete denunciation. Uh, Paul continued to go uh, to, the, to the Jew first, uh, or, you know, to the Gentiles, uh, yeah, to the synagogues first, throughout his ministry, and Romans even talks about that. Uh, Romans is where you were quoting from, by the way. You know, if I could uh, set myself as a curse from, from God, uh, you know, like you said, lose my salvation for all of Israel to be saved. He did say that. That was in Romans. Um, so this was not, uh, this was a, just a denunciation of those particular uh, Jews of that, of that area, that region, that synagogue. Uh, this was not a complete setting aside here. This is just a denunciation we're going to see it happens again in 18, you know, chapter 18, and also in uh, Acts 28 as well, where it specifically uh, has that. So back to you, brother. I did remember uh, what I was going to say there, that the uh, uh, Paul is uh, commonly referred to as the apostle to the Gentiles. And yet we see during his entire ministry, um, he never failed to continue preaching to Jews, so he was not being um, uh, excluding the Jews and only going to the Gentiles. He preached to everybody, and and then also the other apostles, um, the the Paul onlyists, the hyper dispensationalists, they they want to teach that Paul was the one to the Gentiles. The others they never even preached the, the same gospel as Paul. It was a different gospel. And they preach to the Jewish people. But the, the fact is, all the apostles preach to Jews and Gentiles. It, once Cornelius and his family were preached to by Peter, the, the floodgate was opened and they, they all would do it. Now, there was a lot of resistance for a while from the Jerusalem church against Gentiles. But eventually, we see that all the apostles went 
to countries around around the world, and uh, they they were preaching to Gentiles. So each apostle is a priest to Jews and Gentiles, including Paul. All right. Anything else, brother, brother Joe? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on on what you were saying with uh, Paul, uh, saying that he'd give his own eternity up uh, for for his brethren. Uh, it, it has precedent with Moses, who did the same thing with the uh, rather stiff-necked Jews in the desert. He did the same thing, and I was amazed by that. Uh, unlike Noah, who, who prayed that uh, the people he spoke with would not be saved. Lord, don't let them get saved. Uh, so that, there's precedent for that with Moses. The, the other thing I wanted to note, I went looking to see how big uh, Antioch was, uh, just to get a, a kind of a, a feel for the town that they're in. And uh, I want to note uh, that this is the third country. We They were in Jerusalem, then they went to Turkey. Well, now they're in Syria, Syria proper. And uh, just to get a feel for the city that they're in, uh, and it doesn't say what the population was, but what it does say in, in, regarding biblical Syria, Antioch was uh, splendid by its Roman patrons and masters. Uh, it was the queen of the east, the third city after Roman Alexandria and the Roman world. About five miles distant was the uh, suburb of Daphne, this, a spot of uh, sacred to Apollo. So that's the uh, a little bit of background as to the city we're in. Back to you, guys. Let me ask you, I'm, I'm because I'm not positive about this, so I don't want to like say you're wrong. You know, if I'm not sure, but um, I I thought the Antioch was in Turkey, not Syria, and then and then of course Damascus is in Syria. Are you? Yeah, I I, I think that uh, Cornelius I think was in Turkey, but I'm looking right now. At the uh, you just said Bible. Cornelius. You just said Cornelius was in Turkey. Oh, I I may have. I I know that we were in Turkey at one. We're getting feedback. We're going to have to mute. Uh, we uh, we were in Turkey before in the last place we were at. I remember looking that up. But right now I'm at the uh, BibleAtlas.org, and it says Antioch uh, was. Uh, uh, Queen of the East, the third city after Rome and Alexandria of the Roman world, uh, and it says it's in Syria, Antioch in Syria, about five miles distant from the suburb of Daphne, a spot sacred to Apollo. So that's what I was just looking up at in the uh, Bible Atlas. Ah, that's a big surprise to me. Uh, all right, um, anything else before we go on? You just continue on, brother. You're good. Oh, you muted, brother. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was continuing, and then you spoke, and I thought, oh, something's wrong. I must be muted. All right, so picking up with verse uh, 50. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. Uh, but they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Okay, go ahead. Well, that's, that, that's kind of amazing. Uh, later on, Paul will tell people or instruct uh, people, I think it's Paul, if, if they're not accepted, to shake the dust off their feet and move on. And before he's made that statement, here he's doing it. And uh, we're getting feedback on your mic, Ruth. I think that you need to meet. I'm sorry, yeah. I forgot. I forgot. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it looks like uh, uh, that they're prior to giving that instruction to new believers, they're doing that themselves. And I'm a little bit amazed. Uh, it looks like the, the head uh, of the, the sanctuary there, the temple, has uh, gone and rounded up all of the bigwigs and uh, expelled them. But it sounded like the entire city, uh, you know, a great multitude of that, 
apparently large city uh, accepted what they had to say. And uh, I guess they didn't have the authority to, to kill them or imprison them, uh, but somehow they did have the authority to kick them out. And uh, that's what they did. But it's kind of neat that uh, uh, they, be, in being kicked out, they were still full of joy and uh, filled with the Spirit and looking forward to future cities. So uh, back to you. Uh, Well, one of the things I noticed from this text right on is is, is the Word of God, uh, the Gospel, the message of God, and now you know our completed Bible, uh, speaking on behalf of the authority of God. I mean, all that you know tied together. You know, God's declaration to man. Just let's put it in an overarching umbrella type scenario. Uh, you know, it usually does two things. It usually divides people. And it makes, you know, the other thing it does is it makes those the divisions envious or rejoicing. <laughs> and isn't that the same today? Isn't that the same in Jesus' day? Isn't that the same from, you know, throughout all of history? Uh, isn't that the same thing that happened in the Reformation uh, and during the, the Dark Ages before the Reformation? I mean, look at this. The Word of God and uh, God's message, the Gospel, in its simplest form. It was published throughout all the region and uh, just like the Jews were envious uh, back up there in uh, verse 45, uh, uh, they spoke against the things that, that, that you know that Paul spoke, contradicting and blaspheming actually. You know contradicting the Word, to, word of God is, is, is blasphemous. Uh, speaking against uh, the things of God, the, the Gospel, I think that qualifies as blasphemous. I think that's what that's saying. But verse 50 says that those Jews in that region stirred up the devout and honorable women. I think it's <laughs> interesting. Excuse me for being a stereotypical, uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, masculine, or what's that word? Chauvinistic. Chauvinistic. Uh, American, red-blooded American male. But uh, it's interesting there that uh, the Jews stirred up the devout, honorable women. Uh, and chief men of the city, but it lists the women first. I mean, I just think that the uh, the Jews that, that went and stirred up the women first, it seems like, they knew that they'd be the busybodies, and uh, what better way to stir up trouble? I, it just seems it to me uh, uh, that what that what <laughs> is happening there, uh, even though they were called devout and honorable women, you know, the way they probably worded it to these devout and honorable women, just, you know, got their feathers ruffled and caused them to go be busybodies and stirred up trouble and among the chief men of the city. And what did it result in? It says it raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of our coasts. We hate them so much, we're going to expel them out of our coasts. Uh, I mean, if you don't think there's a, there's a concerted effort nowadays to, quote, expel us, Bible-believing Christians, out of America, out of our coasts, out of this world, wherever we're found, uh, then, you're, then you're blind. Because this is, this is what's going on today. Maybe just not as uh, obvious uh, to some people. But, uh, but what did Paul do? But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came to somewhere else, came to Iconium. Uh, okay, you don't want the Word of God? You don't want truth? Uh, dust our hands off, dust our feet off to you. And uh, interesting, the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. Um, we can find our joy despite circumstances, despite whether others accept us or not. I think that's this mentality that, that Paul and Barnabas and these disciples had, that they got the privilege of speaking the truth of the Word of God to people who wanted it, people who didn't want it, but they still got the privilege of doing that, and they were filled with joy uh, in the midst of all of that trouble. So back to you, brothers. Mm. Well, well, Brother Ted, you're certainly not trying to be politically correct, are you? First he comes out, he's an anti-Calvinist, and now he's a chauvinist. And some people like, he's a sexist, too. Well, if we study the whole Bible, we're going to find out there's uh, 
there really is a difference between men and women. I, I remember, a, I think it was around 1970, um, there was a Time magazine, the cover said, men and women are different. It was like a great discovery. <laughs> and I was, uh, I just saw a recent study, I did a show on TV uh, talking about the difference between men's and women's brains and stuff. And, the, the chemistry, even the electric, the way the electricity flows from one side to the other with women, that's why they can multitask, and men's electrical currents are going back and forward and backwards to side to side. And so the electrical activity, the chemi chemical rate, uh, chemistry is different, and that's why men and women tend to have uh, uh, different uh, Different ways that they uh, see things, understand things, react to things. Um, but I don't want to go too get too sidetracked into that. But it, it, it's, people will want to uh, act like, oh, this is this Bible, this Christianity. It's 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 bigoted and it's sexist and it's uh, you know. Well, the fact is, the Bible. Uh, you know, tells us these certain things that are true, and then, and then, centuries, maybe millennia later, science makes a discovery, and it just supports what the Bible told us thousands of years earlier. Uh, but getting back to this point here, the um, verse, um, but but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. Uh, now, remember that there was a great response to Paul's message. The Gentiles were really happy, filled with joy, and people were getting saved. It doesn't say a number. Like when Peter preached a lot of times, 3,000 were saved, 5,000 were saved. It doesn't tell us, but I, I get the feeling that a lot more people got saved there were already a lot of believers in Antioch. Um, matter of fact, Antioch is, is uh, the Bible says, that is where the, the word Christian was first coined to identify someone who believed in Christ, that Jesus was the Christ. Um, so, but the response was divided. A lot of people received the message with joy. And, and then a lot of people rejected it and got angry. Well, is, that's it. that's just the, the typical common reaction. And Brother Ted said that 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 seems to be the reaction all the time. There's always a divided reaction. People will either love the good news or they hate the good news. Why? How could anybody hate the good news? <laughs> I mean, especially if it's truly preached as good news. And Peter and Paul, they're preaching as good news. They're, they're, they're not preaching it as, oh, you're going to go to hell unless you change your life and become really religious and follow all these rules. And you better do it perfectly. And if you don't do it perfectly, you're going to hell. That's not good news. But Jesus died for your sins. You get to go to heaven you just, if you just simply trust him. Uh, that's good news. That should make anybody happy. And yet it doesn't. And it goes back to what Jesus said. He, he said, do not think I came to bring peace but rather division. Families will divide over me, husband against wife, father against son. When I first got saved, it was created such a stir, I, I ended up having to separate from my wife for about six months. I had to move out. We couldn't, we, it was, it was, I was such a, my wife thought I'd lost my mind and become a Jesus freak. I did become a Jesus freak, and then over the years she's begun to understand it, and we were, she's also a believer, but she, um, she thought my initial reaction, I want to study the Bible. You want to study the Bible? You want to have people over, come on over to your house and talk about the Bible? Uh, this was just too much for her to handle, so the uh, house was divided over Jesus, and um, so this is this is normally the, what does happen. But here, here's the interesting thing: the scripture here tells us they dusted off their feet, and it's it's said numerous times. Jesus says to dust when you go into the city. If they if they don't receive you, then then dust off your feet and move on. He says uh, that uh, don't 
cast your pearls to the swine. The pearl represents the gospel, the good news. The swine are the people that mock it and laugh at it and ridicule it. And, you know, don't do that. If people do not accept the message and with joy, then don't continue going back and forth with them. This is the mistake I see so much on YouTube. People want to have an ongoing argument with a non, either a non-believer or someone who does not believe correctly. And they want to have these debates and go on and on, arguing back and forth, making videos, video responses. But Jesus didn't do that. He preached and then he moved on to the next one. Paul, uh, he said, dust off your feet and move on. And that's, that's the, uh, if you don't get the reaction, planted your seeds. If it doesn't come to life, move on. Spread more uh, spread more seeds. Maybe somebody will come after you've left, and they'll come, and then uh, they can water it, and maybe it'll sprout later. I know that, in my experience, that some, some of the results that I've got in terms of presenting the gospel is they've heard it before, and so people planted the seeds, and I was watering it. So the scripture tells us sometimes we plant, sometimes we water. Um, but the important thing to understand is that don't expect people to always believe it with joy and just everybody. And it's not our responsibility. It's not even our, our burden to make someone believe. It is our responsibility to share the good news, and then they'll believe or they won't, and then we move on. And then once they've heard the news, it's between them and the Holy Spirit too, and Jesus. All right, before, before we go to the next chapter anymore, Final thoughts on this chapter here. Well, uh, just just one thing, Luke. Uh, it seems to me that a lot of the street preachers and a lot of the people on YouTube are kind of taking up the Pharisee side, you know, uh, against easy believism as they kind of spit the term. Uh, they they want to follow ritual. They want to say you've got to obey laws. You've got to repent of your sins to the point of uh, change. Uh, so. They're actually uh, picking up where the Pharisees left off. Uh, so I'm not saying they're not saved, but, but they certainly do embrace the very things that Christ came to uh, alleviate. Back to you. All right. Any more, Brother Ted? Okay, let's go to the next chapter. Let me see how much time we have left here. So 3.30. Uh, yeah, we're going to go till four, I guess, so uh, we we can continue on. Um, chapter fourteen, the KJV, and it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together at, into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude of both a multitude both of the Jews and also of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil, affected against the brethren. Long time, therefore, abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided and part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. Well, that, that uh, goes right back to what you were saying, Luke, earlier. You know, Christ uh, came to divide, not to uh, necessarily uh, make everyone ecumenical. And uh, it, it uh, doesn't escape me here that the Gentiles believed, but the Jews, some of them, went to those Gentiles and uh, made their minds evil, affected against the brethren. So it looks like they were kind of seed cast on that hard, or, uh, hard soil or thorny soil or whatever, but it looks like uh, all of the Gentiles were leaning towards uh, the gospel, but the unbelieving Jews were able to uh, whisper in their ears and, uh, and turn them against those who believe. And so uh, there may have been a, a much bigger uh, conversion of the Gentiles if it weren't for the evil part of the Jews. But I am encouraged that it looks like kind of a half the city uh, believed the gospel and half did not. But uh, still, what a what a fantastic result for uh, for their next stop. Back to you. Well, thank you for that, Joe. I just kind of want to just 
agree with your general s sentiment there, your, your statements. Um, the fact that it starts out in verse 1 there where it says a great multitude of both the Jews and the Greeks believed. Uh, this, this, is, uh, this is no small pickings here. This is, this is a great thing. This is a great harvest uh, that God is doing through, through his word, through the message of uh, Paul and Barnabas uh, there. Uh, it is interesting that they went into the synagogue first. <laughs> you know, that's how, how it starts out. And once again, um, that was Paul's custom. Uh, uh, the, the way they did things, went to the synagogue first and so spake. And it says, a great multitude of both Jews and the Greeks believed. To me, this is further proof, uh, not just that, that not if one emphasize that that was his pat pattern or pro uh, process or custom, whatever you have it, whatever you want to call it. But my point is that the the Gentiles were being included, and if there was any doubt by now, I mean, people got to see that this wasn't just small little out of the way towns where Paul and Barnabas will say, well, if a few Gentiles believe it'll it'll be okay. That's not it. I mean, a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. And they're all one. They, 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 they understand that there's now, I don't know how fully they understand it, but they are, understand that Gentiles are included in getting this forgiveness of sins, being justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Uh, they get eternal life. They get the, you know, the, the, the gift of God, eternal life. They, they are in the grace of God by faith in Christ. The Gentiles are being included here. It looks like massive numbers, Jews and Gentiles. But the unbelieving Jews, in verse 2 as in verse 4, uh, they stirred up the Gentiles, and I think that means stirred up the unbelieving Gentiles, and made their minds evil or opposed to, affected against the brethren. Interesting language there. I'd like to see, Luke, if you can read that when it comes your turn in the Amplified. Uh, made, made their minds evil, affected against the brethren. And my goodness, you have that today in, in untold scores of, of accounts to where let's just get a bunch of people stirred up against, you know, the message of God, against the Christians, against these believers. Uh, same thing, same thing going on. And uh, long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, uh, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands, by the apostles' hands. So, um, like I said, I'd like to hear you read this in the Amplified. Maybe you can give us a little bit of insight into the how that uh, might be more, a little more understandable to us. But verse 4, I wanted to speak on, the multitude of the city was divided, just like you were saying, guys. Uh, you know, when some people believe, some people don't believe, division results. Uh, that's the old saying, what is it? When you're in a family reunion or when you're around folks, uh, mixed company, Never discuss religion or politics here, uh, because all that goes together. You know, all that you know it shows what your values are, what you hold important, what you, what you hold uh, dear to your life, and uh, uh, what's ultimately valuable and what's true and what's right versus what's wrong. Uh, you know, uh, it truly shows for where your heart is. Uh, the multitude of the city was divided. Part held with the the. Jews, and when it says the Jews there, it's not a broad brushstroke because a lot of the Jews believed up in verse 1. Uh, so part held with the unbelieving Jews specifically, and part held with the apostles, uh, the believers, and, and the apostles that proclaimed it. Uh, back to you, brother. Okay. Um, verse 5, Paul I'll just I'll read those verses in the Amplified and then comment. Uh, now in Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went into the Jewish synagogue together and spoke in such a way with such power and boldness that a large number of Jews as well as Greeks believed and confidently accepted Jesus as Savior. But the unbelieving Jews who rejected Jesus as Messiah stirred up and embittered the minds of the Gentiles against the believers. Um, that, that seems to be saying there that, in agreement with your point there, that uh, the, um, it was against the, the, 
the Gentile non-believers against the Gentile believers. Um, so Paul and Barnabas stayed for a long time speaking boldly and confidently for the Lord who continued to testify to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders, attesting miracles, be done by them. Uh, but the people, uh, let me stop there, the, the signs and wonders, of course, it's still going on. Uh, attesting miracles, attesting. That's why the miracles are done, uh, uh, to uh, attest to the fact that this, this preaching is the truth. Uh, but the people of the city were divided. Some were siding with the Jews and some with the apostles. Let me see. Yeah, I guess that's it, verse 4. Um, so we see the same thing going on here. Uh, first of all, we said earlier that even though Paul said in the last city, you darn Jews keep rejecting this, I'm going to preach to the Gentiles now. Well, he didn't mean, he didn't mean from here forward in every city. He, he, he said, in this city, I'm going to preach to the Jet Go Gentiles. You reject it here. But when he goes to the next city, he still goes right to preach to the, the Jews again. And, and, of course, and Jews and Gentiles. But he, he never neglects uh, to tell the good news to the Jews. They, they, they logically should be the ones that, believe naturally because what he's doing is going to the scriptures the Old Testament the law and the prophets and saying look at all the things that were written about the Messiah these were all the things about Jesus and so they should understand this better than the Gentiles a lot of, a lot of the Gentiles they didn't have any knowledge or, or uh, um, some of them converted but but the Gentiles as a whole uh, they had all kinds of varieties of religious viewpoints, and, and, and even some of them were polytheists. Even the idea of a, one God was foreign to them. So it just it would be more natural. It's just the natural thing is for a Jew to be a believer, because the Old Testament says there's a Savior going to be coming, and and these are the things that are going to happen. And sure enough, that's that describes Jesus, uh, and yet. Uh, some some can see that and they believe and some don't. Uh, but uh, then again we see the division. So he goes and preaches to the Jews at the synagogue. That there's a great division and there's signs and wonders. This pattern, this kind of uh, thing is repeated over and over again in each city he, they go to. Uh, now the verse that you wanted me to, I don't remember the significance of the verse that you wanted to be said, but I did read it in the Amplified. So before we go on, any, any other thoughts? No, that's good. Thank you, Luke. All right. All right, let me read a little further. I think maybe we have one more portion, and then we'll prepare to close here. Uh, verse 5. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews, with their rulers to use them despitefully and stone them, they were aware, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derby, cities of Lycaonia, and unto the region that lieth round about, and there they preached the gospel. So we'll stop at verse seven here. Well, it, it, it looks like uh, it looks like they were running for their lives. Uh, you know, they saw that they they had done what they could do there and have, have moved on. Uh, Derby, I it seems to me uh, in my memory somewhere that was a, a hotbed of uh, goddess worship, uh, but I, I can't say that for sure. I looked on the map and uh, looked up uh, uh, this city, Iconium. And uh, it looks like it was about 60 miles or, or three days hard travel from, uh, from uh, Antioch. So they were quite a ways off. And I, I don't know how far this next city is, but uh, uh, I guess, uh, you know, their life was at risk and, and they had done all they could do uh, short of uh, 
ending their, their second missionary travels very quickly. Um, and it looks like the Jewish rulers uh, gathered up the Gentiles, and, uh, and uh, both of them went after them. So uh, there's an alliance of sorts uh, at work here. And it looks like they weren't afraid to stone them. So uh, the last city they were in, they were just uh, uh, exiled. There was no, no talk of killing them. But uh, here it looks like they were going to put them down. So uh, different cities, different rulers, uh, different reactions. And this one was about as bad as it gets, I guess. Back to you, Luke. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, I'm, I don't know what to say beyond what you said. You pretty much summed it up. Um, I'd like to read verse 5 from the New King James. It says, And when a violent attempt was made, by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, uh, they became aware of it, the apostles, the believers, and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities in Lycanoia, I can't, I'm not sure pronunciation, and to the surrounding region, they were preaching the gospel there. So like you said, uh, Brother Joe, they, they pretty much did all they could. Um, and once, the, uh, once there comes the thing that just sticks out to me here is once uh, the people, the common folk, you might say, find that it's okay to persecute and bully and even use violence against a, a certain group of people, once they see that either local township rulers, religious rulers, or regional rulers, people in the highest offices that they have to deal with or that they'd have to answer to, once evil common folk, uh, thugs, see that uh, evil ruling snakes think it's okay to persecute a certain group, uh, then they're going to do it because they won't have to answer to the authorities for persecuting them and actually even threatening at, went as far as to want to abuse and stone them. So uh, the disciples became aware of it and being wise as serpents and harmless as doves, <laughs> Uh, they fled to Lystra and other places, and they didn't just say, wow, we better never try, try that again. It's just what they did when they got to the, those other places is they preached the gospel there. These guys were bold. Uh, we would do well to, uh, to take a look at their boldness and their example uh, uh, and, uh, and implement it as we can. Back to you guys. Mm. Uh if I remember correctly, the uh, right after Paul's conversion, he immediately went to the synagogue and preached, and preached the gospel, and just as he did the same message. He did over and over again, and uh, it created such a problem that his life was threatened, and they had to lure him out of the city. I think this was in Damascus. And they had to lure him over the city wall in a in a basket to, at night to, because there were threats against his life. So immediately, this is the reaction. They wanted to kill Saul. What a betrayal. This Saul was supposed to be rounding up the Christians. Now he became one of them. And so, and that, uh, and then uh, now we see that they're exiled. He's exiled, and now they're threatening to stone him. Uh, so th this happens, you know, Paul gives an account of all the things he suffered at, at, in one of his epistles, and there's a long series. I, I won't go over it all right now, but the, uh, it, the list is, is quite long. It just seems like everywhere they go, some people are going to believe, and the rest of the people want to kill him. <laughs> so, uh, let me read the whole thing, uh, that portion in the Amplified. That uh, was verse... Um, Verse 5, starting with verse 5. Um, when there was an attempt by both the Gentiles and the Jews, together with their rulers, to shamefully mistreat and to stone them, they, aware of the situation, escaped to Lystra and Derby, taking refuge in the cities of Laconia and the neighboring region, and there they continued to preach the good news. All right. Uh, 
All right, so that's all I have to say. Any, any thoughts on that before we sum things up? No further thoughts for me, Luke. All right, then. Let's... Uh, okay. Well, why, don't, uh, why don't you give your uh, uh, summation of the study, and, and uh, then we'll do the gospel message. We have 10 minutes left. Go ahead. Well, Luke, uh, the, the one part today that, that sticks in my mind is uh, something you said at the very beginning, and I found it here in Matthew 10, 34, and 35. Think not that I came to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace but a sword, for I came to set man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and so on. Uh, this is, you know, if you, if you were to read that verse to the typical uh, unbeliever or non-Christian, and say, well, this is a, a horrible example of yet another religion causing trouble. But you have to understand in the way Christ is speaking here. He died for the sins of the whole world. He died for each side of that division there. And uh, what Christ is saying is, uh, and it's expressed brilliantly here through our entire study, is that the gospel divides those who... Uh, seek God and those who seek darkness, uh, those who respond to the light and those who prefer darkness over the light. And so those those two concepts uh, are, are really the, the anchor of what we've studied today. You know, it, it talks about the Gentile believers uh, who have responded to the light and the, the Jewish believers responding to the light, and then both groups who uh, prefer the darkness or, or uh, choose to reject the gospel for whatever reason. And uh, so there is a division here, but it's a necessary division, and uh, uh, the world is better off for it, those who uh, have accepted the gospel uh, for sure. And so uh, I think the lesson that I've learned throughout our, our uh, study today is that some people will respond to the gospel and some won't. I think uh, religious tradition and religion uh, has been the primary reason that, that people do not respond to the gospel rather than the reason they do. And so uh, that's, that's uh, the overall take I got from today's study. Back to you. Well, um so just summing up what we got at the end of chapter 13 and this first part of chapter 14, um, just like it's been said, you guys have put it so good that uh, the, the preaching and the pro proclamation of, of the good news, the gospel, uh, is just that. It's, it's, it's proclaiming truth. Uh, it's proclaiming the good news. Uh, some people just don't receive it as such. And... Uh, the preaching and proclaiming of Jesus Christ, the person of Christ, the only way to have, as they said, forgiveness of sins, to be justified from all things, to have eternal life, that includes all people, uh, no matter how well they, you know, behave a lot of the time, you know, it's, it's uh, all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Jew, Gentiles, young, old, male, female, religious, non-religious, all people have come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. And, uh, you know, apparently these guys, the unbelieving Jews, the religious ones, in their, in their religious zeal uh, were so obstinate to the gospel and so uh, set in their ways that uh, they couldn't see the truth. Uh, and that's sad. Uh, they, were, they were entrenched in not uh, truth, but tradition looks like. And the, the proclamation and preaching of the gospel of truth is always going to result in uh, division, unfortunately. But we can't, uh, it's, it's disheartening. It's going to be disheartening. Uh, it is to me. Uh, it, it, sometimes it's, it's almost crushing to feel the rejection of someone else to, to truth, uh, especially to the simplicity of the gospel, you know. It's kind of like, uh, I've heard it said one time, and I, I agree with this, you know, the gospel is such good news, the real gospel, uh, believing on Christ and, and just getting eternal life as a free gift. It's almost like 
if it sounds too good to be true, then it's, it's probably the gospel. That, you know, just simply believe. And that's obviously what these uh, Jewish religious leaders were rejecting and some of the Gentiles as well. Just in 13 and chapter 14, I'm just getting the fact that the division results uh, and uh, it's disheartening, but the good thing is we see the apostles just continuing on and carrying on and, uh, and preaching uh, and proclaiming truth wherever they go. So it's a, it's a good example to us. That, that's what I got mainly from today's study. Thanks, brother. Hmm. Well, the, we're seeing that uh, when, when the gospel is preached, that there's a, a a division, just as Jesus, you know, said there would be. People divide over him, and we could say people divide over the gospel. The gospel is a Greek word that means the good news, the message that salvation or um, having eternal life in heaven, that that is offered to you as a free gift. How could anybody? not react favorably to that. And yet we see that there are these two reactions. Some people accept it and believe it, receive it with joy, understanding that it is good news, the best news ever. And other people, for probably a wide variety of reasons, they reject it. And some reject it with great anger. And uh, you can see how some of these people rejected it so uh, so much that they wanted to kill the messenger. So what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with the gospel? Um, the gospel is, 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 is so simple that a little child could understand it. And, it, 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 and it's so easy um, to, to get saved that anybody could do it. Uh, so what will you do with it? Um, the problem is that most people have been brainwashed uh, not, uh, throughout history. The history of the world and currently the world worldwide today. People think that uh, those people who do believe that there is a life after death and there is a, a judgment and heaven or hell, if, if, if a person already believes that much, then what's the difference between the people who go to heaven and go to hell? How is this destination determined? And almost everybody in the world believes it's determined by your own merit. Are you good enough for heaven? Uh, they think that they'll die, die, go before God and They'll present their case. God will say, why should I let you into heaven? And they'll say, well, I did this and I did that. I, 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 didn't I do well enough? Aren't I good enough? Some people will plead before God, are I good enough? Will you let me in? And other people will boast, I deserve heaven because I'm religious and I did this. But if you're basing your salvation on the things that you've done, then it's doomed to failure because the Bible says that uh, we cannot go to heaven based upon our own efforts, our works. If you've worked at it, if you really tried to change your life and be a good person, and, and you've really worked at it, if you think, well, I've, I've joined the religions, I've become a religious person, I've followed all these religious rules, uh, so I'm putting a lot of effort in it, I deserve heaven. But the Bible says that it's impossible to get to heaven through our religious works. We need to understand that, reject that as a possibility, and understand the futility of it. And then we will come to our senses and realize, I need to be saved. I need to be rescued. I'm in a hopeless, hopeless situation. I need God to save me. And the Bible says that that's only God can save you. And the Bible says that Jesus is God and Savior. So... Instead of putting your faith in your own ability, your own effort, put your faith in the Savior, Jesus. A little bit about Jesus that's important for you to know. The Bible says that he is eternal God Almighty. It says that he came down from heaven and became a man. It says that he became a man in order to die. 
It says that he died on a cross, and by dying, he paid for all of our sins. It says that he was buried, but on the third day, he rose from the dead bodily to prove that his claims were true, that he is God and Savior. And it says that if you'll put your faith in him rather than faith in yourself, that he will give you eternal life as a free gift. No strings attached. Nothing required on your part because he did it all for you. Put your faith in this person, Jesus, and put your faith in what he's done for you rather than what you're trying to do to earn heaven. Accept heaven as a gift rather than a reward for all your hard work. And when you do that, the Bible says you are guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. And the Bible says when you put your faith in Jesus, it is irrevocable and irreversible. So you can rest assured that uh, you're going to go to heaven no matter what. I hear my wife vacuuming in the other room. I hope it's not distorting all this. But uh, all right, uh, put your faith in Jesus now. Receive the gift of eternal life. Thank you for watching. And we, we're trying to do these uh, Bible studies uh, daily, uh, 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, we'll, we'll do it every day that's possible. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.